We hear stories, don't we, of Christian communities that have turned sour, that have gone wrong, that have become places of profound hurt and even destruction, churches that have just lost their way. How can we be guarded and protected? How do we pursue health and flourishing? Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller and glad you're with us today. And Jonathan, I'm glad we're, we're going to be talking about this in today's broadcast because there are a lot of people who have been hurt, even by the church. And uh, they're, they're wondering, now, what do we do and how do I make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again? Well, it is a great sadness and I think many of us will know stories. Many will have had experiences of this. And of course, we, on one level ought to be shocked when things within Christian community are, are, are not as they might be and not as God calls them to be. On another level, we shouldn't be totally surprised because we're all still sinful and fallen people and in need of the grace of God and the help of the help of the Lord by His Spirit. And these things do happen, but our great need, each one of us who follow Christ, is to look to the Scriptures and to hear and read once again what are the standards to which God calls us in Christian community. And those standards are very, very high. And as we read of them and learn of them, we then look to the Lord by His Spirit to help us to be and to do what we cannot be and cannot do on our own. But He does help us. And I think the great encouragement is when you see this working well, you see Christian community functioning in a healthy way, and you say, well, no human being, no group of people could produce community like this on their own without God doing something very special. And and I don't know about you, Steve, but I, ha- I have seen that kind of community at work imperfectly, but but at the same time gloriously. Yeah. And it's a great evidence of the reality of, of, of the faith. Yeah, uh, like you, I've seen that as well. And uh, while it's imperfect, it is encouraging. And I hope that you're going to be encouraged today. As you uh, grab your Bible and join us in the book of Colossians, we're in chapter 3, and we continue the message, Putting on the New. Here is Jonathan. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart, verse 15. Notice it there with me. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's interesting here in a section where Paul is focused on relationships within the church that he should emphasize peace within our hearts. You see, I read that, I read the call, you know, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, and I immediately think of my own personal concerns and the implications for me. If God gives me a deep sense of his peace, I'll, you know, I'll sleep better, I'll be happier, and and so on, which is no doubt true. But Paul is thinking here about the body of Christ. He makes that clear. He says so in verse 15. This peace is the thing to which we were called in one body. And so we are prompted, aren't we, to consider the nature of the, the connections here. And we don't have to ponder for too long before we gain insight. Now, here is something that I've observed, and maybe you have observed it too. When a person within a Christian family is causing waves and disruption, is picking fights even, is caustic or full of unjust criticism or something like that, I'm afraid, of course, this sort of thing does happen in churches from time to time. When, when When an individual is behaving like that, I've come to see over time that there is usually something else going on in their hearts. The the presenting issue is rarely the underlying issue, the fundamental issue, the real issue. And, And the need is not actually to satisfy the immediate issue or complaint. The need is actually for God to do a deep work in this person's heart and to bring them to a place of real peace. But if the peace of Christ rules the heart, well, we're in a totally different place. Now, this is a different context, but just perhaps to drive home the point of it's helpful. If you were to think of a a leader in a nation who was a real warmonger, and I won't name names here, but history has provided us with some awful examples of this, as has uh, contemporary uh, news, really. But um, if you think of a ruler who is a brute and a bully who stirs strife and conflict, and then imagine for a second how different a place the world would be if the peace of Christ ruled that particular heart. I mean, imagine it, the world would be transformed. Countless lives would be saved. I've often thought that in different times of conflict. If only this leader who is bent on war, if only this person knew the peace of Christ within, what a difference that would make. Now, the context, of course, is different, but we're thinking of the local church and interpersonal relationships within the church. But we see the truth that Paul is, is driving at. If the peace of Christ rules the heart of the individual, community relationships are transformed for good. But to fully grasp what Paul is talking about here, we need to consider the multiple dimensions 
of the peace of Christ. Foundationally, Jesus is the one who gives us objective peace with God. We think of Romans 5 and verse 1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the essence of the gospel, of course, and it's the foundation of everything else. Having then been set at peace with our maker and our judge, the peace of Christ then allows us a subjective sense of inner peace, the kind of peace that you know, lets us put our head on the pillow and sleep at night, knowing that despite all our worldly concerns, all our failures and all our sin, despite all those things and more, all is fundamentally well with us. You know, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's the peace of Christ. But then this Christ who gives us objective peace with God and a subjective experience of peace within, he then teaches us and in fact requires us to live at peace relationally with one another, and he enables us to do that by his Spirit. And so the Christ who is our Lord, and we must remember that he is our Lord, he causes his peace to rule within our hearts. That's the language here. His peace is a comprehensive whole. It comes to us as a gift of grace, but here's the thing. Just as we need to you know, put on the kindness of God, so also we need to allow the peace of Christ to rule within our hearts. We need to submit our worries and our our cares and our concerns to him and take hold of his peace. We need to submit our inclinations to demand our own way, to push and to spar. We need to submit all that to him, and we need to allow his peace to rule. You'll notice the extra instruction at the end of verse 15, which actually kind of looks like a throwaway at first glance, but of course, because of the tightness of the logic of the Apostle Paul, it's closely linked. But he says here, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule and be thankful. When we're in a state of inner turmoil, gratitude quickly disappears, doesn't it, in the rearview mirror? I'm all worried and chewed up about something, and I can't see anything to be grateful for. I'm in a state of conflict with another believer. It's all their fault, you know, as it always is. The Lord hasn't shown them yet the error of their ways. I'm waiting for that, and I'm too grumpy to be thankful for anything. No, no, no. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. And as you enjoy his peace and submit to his peace, remember with gratitude all that you have in Christ. Forgiveness, cleansing, power by the Spirit, hope for eternity. Be thankful. If we would flourish and be healthy and whole as a people of God, we must allow the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts. And next, we must let the word of Christ dwell within. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, building a healthy community is never simply about the avoidance of conflict and the prevention of harm. This is true in the secular realm, if we think of it, and it may be helpful just to think in those terms for a brief moment. When we build cities and communities, we don't just invest in you know, crime prevention We don't just build up a police force and install locks on gates and doors and security cameras to monitor activity. That's not where community building ends. That is, if you like, a kind of precondition for building community in a fallen world. You need harm prevention measures in place, but community building goes way beyond that. It considers how to invest in people and how to help people flourish. It involves building schools and libraries and parks and centers for the arts and for recreation and so much more besides. When it comes to Christian community, when it comes to the church, Paul is not simply concerned with harm prevention, with maintaining peace, with healing conflict. Those things are preconditions for health and for flourishing, but they are not the end game. No, Paul wants us to see that a healthy Christian community is a place where each member is actively invested in the flourishing of others. And the means for this is not primarily through programs or through facilities. It's through each person individually and the whole church corporately being deeply invested in, you guessed it, the Word of God. It's about each individual and the church as a whole having the Word of Jesus Christ dwell in us richly. If you ever find yourself responsible for taking care of a swimming pool, if you're in that privileged position, you will know that one thing you need to do is to ensure that your sanitizer level is kept appropriately high. Chlorine, bromine, whatever it is, that's essential for for health. You let that drop and then lots of people swim in the pool. Maybe a little rat gets in there and drowns. Maybe a family of frogs get sucked into the filter. And pretty soon, what do you have? You have a swamp. 
It's deeply unpleasant. You see, you need, a, a, you need a cleansing agent permeating that water at a good level for it to be a healthy swimming environment. If you are a farmer growing crops in your fields, one thing you know you need to do, one responsibility you have, is to ensure that you have a rich mixture of fertilizer permeating your soil, if anything's going to grow there. You need to keep the nutrient levels nice and high, or you're going to have a measly, unhealthy crop at the end of the season. The Word of God is an agent that both cleanses and nourishes the people of God. It is both sanitizer and fertilizer for the heart. And if we are to be a healthy community, a healthy church, a people who are fighting sin, growing in grace, here's what we need. That we need the Word of God to be dwelling richly within us. We need to keep ourselves saturated with the Word. We need to keep the levels up all the time. Go back to chlorine just for a moment. You know, one of the things about it is that it's actually a daily thing, a daily responsibility to monitor the levels. You let it go for two, three, four days, and you've got murky water, you've got algae, you've got trouble brewing. It takes a while to get it back. We need to be topping up with the Word of God regularly from multiple angles. I referred to this actually last time, but here it is again. Let me say it again. Here is what we need to give attention to, our own personal Bible reading family Bible reading, our study of the Scriptures with others, hearing the preaching of the Word of God, benefiting from music that edifies us, every single input we can get so that our lives are saturated with the Word of God. But having the Word dwell in us richly, it enables us to minister the Word then to one another. And what results here is a kind of virtuous cycle. Notice what we are to do. This is all of us. No one escapes. Middle of verse 16, we are to be teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Just let that sink in for a moment. All of us within the church family, each saved person, each believer within the fellowship, we are to be engaged in the ministry of the word to one another, taking opportunities to teach and apply the word, even to admonish from the word, to speak the word of God into the lives of brothers and sisters around us. We are to do that in formal ways, and we are to do that in informal ways ways as we have opportunity. And this ranges right from teaching a Bible class or a Sunday school class to leading a midweek small group to sending a note of encouragement to another believer that is grounded in Scripture to giving a quick phone call during a time of difficulty and simply speaking gospel truth to a brother or a sister who needs to hear it. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called Putting on the New, part of our series Walking Worthy. And we'll get back to our look at Colossians chapter 3 in just a moment. Well, maybe you've wondered if you can trust the Bible. You've maybe read the first four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You've seen some differences between those Gospels. And you've wondered, well, because there's differences, can I trust them? New Testament scholar Peter Williams looks at those different accounts of the same events in the Gospels. Then he also looks at non-Christian sources and how those four Gospels reflect the cultural context of their day. And after doing that and more, he's showing how, whether you're a skeptic or a scholar, you can find powerful arguments for trusting the Gospels. We'd love to send you a copy of his book, Can We Trust the Gospels, as our way of saying thank you for your financial support. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. Again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org and our phone number is one 1- 833-998-7884. Well, let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. And then notice how else our lives are to overflow with the word. It's been referenced already, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Here is another aspect of our ministry of the word. When we get together on a Sunday and we sing, We are meant to be singing from an overflow of the Word of God that dwells within us and among us. We are to be singing gospel truth. We are to be singing Bible truth. Our singing is an overflow of the Word. It's an expression of the Word. Now, now this is actually huge. There's a whole theology of corporate worship here, and we're not going to unpack it all. But it says to us, doesn't it, that what we sing on Sunday must be an expression of Bible truth. It must be a form of the ministry of the Word. And that's, that's what we aim for. That's what, we, that's what we're, we're, we're shooting for here. We do our best to choose songs that express truth faithfully from the Word of God and that cause that truth then to dwell within our hearts as we go from here. 
And this is just interesting. In a way, it's a side note, but I'll just notice it. Just notice where our singing is directed. I think it's fair to say that there are two directions of focus here. Our singing is linked together with our teaching and admonishing of one another. So there is a, there's a horizontal focus where we, where we sing to benefit one another, to minister truth to one another. But we are also singing, Paul shows us, with our hearts lifted to the Lord in thankfulness, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so there is this vertical dimension as well. We sing to one another and we sing to the Lord. There we go, 32nd theology of corporate worship. But that is so rich, isn't it? There's so much there. I mentioned a moment ago that there is a virtuous cycle in all this. And what I mean by that is this. As God's Word dwells in us richly, as we are saturated with the Word, we are able to minister, to teach, to speak, to admonish, to sing. We are able to minister the Word to one another. And as we do so, guess what happens? The Word dwells more and more richly within us and among us. And friends, this is a picture of healthy Christian community. This is at the heart of what it means and looks like to be a wholesome, flourishing church. And within all this, we all have a part to play. Individually, we need to saturate our lives with the Word of God. How's that going? How's it going? What other entry points and inputs could you put in place in your life to get more of the Word into your heart and into your mind? We then need to be intentional about finding ways to speak the Word of God to one another, to teach, to admonish, to encourage. Where are you doing that? How are you doing that? Are there other opportunities you could take in order to do that more effectively? And then together, we need to be committed as a church family to ensuring that every aspect of our life together and our ministry is word-saturated. Every ministry function, every event, we try to fill it with the Word of God. We seek to ensure that our ministry is word-driven so that the Word of Christ will dwell in us richly as a church family. And together, we need to keep that commitment. We need to hold one another to account on that and guard that focus. I'll tell you, it is so easy in a busy church just to get distracted with activity for activity's sake and then to lose the focus. But here's the way of flourishing and of health. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Fourthly and finally, just as we close, if we would be a healthy community, a flourishing church, here's what we must do. Do all things in the name of Christ, verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We have various companies and representatives who come to our home to do work on behalf of their company. The gas company sends their rep to read our meter and occasionally to perform some maintenance or repairs. The rep comes in a, in a gas company car wearing a uniform and a name badge. He or she reads the meter, conducts the maintenance, and then leaves. Similarly, the uh, hydroelectric company, they come, they, they check the meter, maybe they do a, a locate on an underground cable or something else, and then they, they leave. We have a company that fertilizes the lawn and sprays for weeds. You might not notice it for looking at our lawn, but they, they do come. Company truck, uh, uniform, they arrive, they spray, they put a little sign on the lawn, we receive a large bill, they leave. Now, if the gas company guy came, and offered to spray the lawn, or the weed guy came and uh, delivered a pizza, or the electric guy came and offered to clear our gutters, our eaves troughing, we, we'd, we'd look at the company car, we'd look at the uniform, the badge, and we'd wonder what on earth they were thinking of. What are you doing? You represent a particular company. You come under a particular name, and there is a limited range of appropriate activity that you can conduct under that name. Paul is making a very simple but important point in verse 17. You and I are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to him. We serve him. We would save a great deal of grief and trouble for ourselves and for one another if we operated under a simple principle. When you speak, and when you act, make sure you are appropriately and properly representing Jesus. Only doing and only saying things that are appropriate for his servants, his representatives. 
in the context of the local church, if you and I made a point of only saying and doing those things that we can truly do and say in Jesus' name as his representatives, claiming that these words and actions are consistent with his character and his will, you know, what a lot of grief we would spare ourselves and spare others. You see, I, I, I can't take you aside after church for a quiet bit of nasty gossip about a brother or sister and claim that I'm doing so in Jesus' name. Can't do it. None of us can go and, you know, plot a mini rebellion against our elders and claim that we are doing that in Jesus' name. We, we can't lie to one another in Jesus' name. We, we can't grumble and complain and pretend, oh, I'm doing that in Jesus' name. Can't humiliate, exclude a brother or sister from the fellowship, claim to do it in Jesus' name. Friends, with, if with all our activity and all our words within the local church, we stopped and simply asked, can I say this in Jesus' name? Can I do this in Jesus' name? Can I claim to be serving and representing the Lord Jesus Christ as I do and I say this? If we stopped and honestly asked that question, we would actually, I think, turn back from so much that we do and so much that we say. And notice just briefly that Paul adds the note of thanksgiving, end of verse 17. In every word or deed, not only do we resolve to act and to speak in Jesus' name, but we resolve to give thanks to the Father through him. Again, actually, that is given as a guard for us. Father, thank you that I have this opportunity to speak to my sister in Christ. Thank you that I have this opportunity to serve my, my brother. Now, if I'm actually in my heart of hearts intending to slander or undermine or serve my own interests, I'm stopped short at that point. I can't thank the Father for that opportunity. The tone and the tenor of it is wrong. The Father hasn't given me this to do as a servant of Jesus. I can't, I can't do this thing as an overflow of my gratitude to the Lord. No, I've, I, clearly I need to hold back. I need to repent. I need to change course. We hear stories, don't we, of Christian communities that have turned sour, that have, that have gone wrong, that have become places of profound hurt and even destruction, churches that have just lost their way. How can we be guarded and protected? How do we pursue health and flourishing? Here are the four things that we can do, four things we must do, four things we must pursue with the help that only Jesus, by his Spirit, can provide. Put on love. Put on love for others. Let our hearts be ruled by the peace of Jesus Christ. Let his word dwell richly in our lives and in our fellowship together. Do all things in Jesus' name, giving thanks to the Father through him. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and our message, Putting on the New, part of our series, Walking Worthy. And if you've missed any part of today's broadcast or previous broadcast in the series, come and listen online at EncounterTheTruth.org. While you're there, I hope you'll check out our weekly e-devotional, our links to social media, and sign up for the newsletter. That's all at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Jonathan, for years now, we have had people attacking the Gospels, sometimes trying to figure out things that they say are conflicting accounts in various Gospels, and even groups of scholars who have got together and said, well, we're not so sure about this, or we're not so sure about that. And uh, I know you've got a friend from the UK who has written a book entitled, Can We Trust the Gospels? It's written by Peter Williams. And Jonathan, what, what argument is Peter making in this book? Well, Steve, I don't think it's going to surprise you or surprise any of our listeners when I say that, yes, I think uh, Peter's case is very compelling and very strong for why we can trust the Gospels. His answer is yes, we can trust them. As Christian believers, we need to be willing to engage with the arguments and to really think through the issues. And I think for those who are exploring the faith but maybe aren't yet committed Christians, you know, you want to know, are these documents in the Bible reliable and can I take them seriously? And, and Peter's got serious arguments to engage with. And so, again, we would just love to get this resource into your hands so that you can open up the arguments for yourself and engage with the evidence yourself. Well, as you give a gift of any amount in supporting Counter the Truth this month, we do want to send you, and we'll send you a copy of this book. Again, it's entitled, Can We Trust the Gospels? You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's EncounterTheTruth.org or 1-833-998-7884. 
For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.